Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another thing where I talk about things. Today we're going to be talking about Ico, but not right away, because uh, I actually tried to do this video once previously in the week, and it didn't pan out because my description of Ico was very rambly. I realized some of the way through that there's actually not much of a story to Ico. It's a great uh, adventure and action sort of anime, but uh, there's really not a whole lot of intrigue and really a whole lot of story to tell about it. So uh, I recommend it, but when we get into that, we'll... we'll uh, uh, not have a whole lot to say. So before we begin, I was going to talk about news and things that are going on. Uh, first up, um, Claudia and I are about halfway through uh, her pregnancy, where it turns out we're going to have a boy. We got to go see the, the doctor, and they had a look, and they were like, oh, that's a boy. There it is. Uh, which is kind of nice, because sometimes if you go to the ultrasound, the baby will be asleep, and they might sleep in kind of an awkward position to where you can't really make out their gender. Uh, but fortunately, our, our, uh, our, our future son was awake and rolling around and wiggling and stuff like that. So uh, the doctor got a lot, of good, a lot of good shots. We got a lot of like, good stuff on the ultrasound and things like that. Uh, it's almost too bad because I did want to make the joke. I was like, and this is the first time that our boy disappointed us. You know, uh, uh, before he was even out of the womb, he was letting us down. But uh, skirted right by that opportunity. Oh, I'll have to wait until he, until he makes some other mistake later on in life. So, um... Yes, uh, uh, that's there. We're excited about that. Uh, Claudia and I have been watching a bunch of Disney films. Um, I'm not sure if she's on a Disney kick because the baby or or what it is, but she keeps like singing Disney songs, and then she has to go see if she has this like the video in her collection. So uh, gradually, Claudia has been collecting like pretty much the entire Disney catalog. Uh, I forgot how many liberties they really took with Hercules. Like I, I knew it, but um, even when I was a kid, when I watched Hercules, I was on like a big. Uh, uh, Greek legend kick when I was when I was that I can't remember like what it was it was like fourth grade or something like that like I read a lot of books when I was uh, when I was in grade school and um, I remember even then being kind of annoyed by how Hercules just didn't even try or maybe it wasn't when Hercules came out maybe it was just when I saw it first but it felt like Hercules doesn't even like try to uh, use it just like completely wholesale makes up characters it's like oh Hades the evil ruler of the underworld and it's like no you're you're thinking of the devil, and uh, Zeus is like God. He's like this benevolent, you know, whatever. It was really frustrating because uh, none of these characters acted like this in their legends. None of these characters. Are... But uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Incredibles is still a great film. Would watch that again. Uh, watched it again. They're coming up with that sequel. Um, but yeah, but that's that's in the uh, the family news. That's coming up, so we're excited about that. Uh, in the business of Don somewhere, I've been working on Steve. Uh, I'm ahead of schedule. For the first time ever in the, I don't even know how long, years. Uh, the thing with the animations is that you always say to yourself, like, well, I'll have this done at this period. But there's so much work that goes into an animation that you're never actually done when you think you're going to be. So by the time that that deadline comes around, uh, it passes and there's still lots of work to do and you're behind schedule. So I've always been behind schedule. Um, you know, you are overly optimistic about how fast you can get things done. Um, but with Steve, being that uh, everything is kind of more compartmentalized like you do a page and it takes me about two days maybe like a day and a half kind of depending on what's going on to do a steve page so uh uh with two steves a week i've been able to get a third steve done and so now i'm ahead of schedule i'm not ahead of production yet but i plan to get ahead of production and then uh, uh, once I get kind of ahead of production, I have uh, some buffer room, some leeway. And so if I want to take some time off or focus on other projects for like a week or something like that, then I'll be able to do that without actually falling behind on the update schedule. So uh, that'll be really nice. And my plan is, is that uh, once I get a good buffer for go going for Steve, um, I'll take some time to finish off those those animations and things. And, and uh, not only that, but on, on uh, the weekends and whatever that I've been doing extra Steves, uh, once I've got that buffer zone, and then I could just stop doing extra steves and just keep ahead at my normal pace and then uh, you know work on stuff during the weekends uh, Fridays also I've been doing a lot of script writing lately uh, so like today is Friday this is when I'm doing this filming um, so after this I'm gonna get back to writing but I've been writing out stuff for kids fiscally responsible orphanage um, the way that the comics are gonna work is that Steve is Steve is actually kind of a superhero comic and uh, as far as I can tell the way that things are going, it looks like Steve's going to be about, you know, 20, 25 pages per, per book. So about the average, like, American superhero comic. And uh, this isn't because I'm forcing it to fit in this goal, it's just that as I think about it, Steve's progressing along fast enough that uh, by the time I'm done with this first adventure with Steve, I think we'll probably be about, I don't know, 20, 25 pages in. Uh, should be about right. And then... Um, 
I'll just kind of keep going with Steve. Like, I have a whole bunch of notes on Steve. You wouldn't believe it, but, like, the Steve universe is surprisingly well fleshed out. There's actually a lot of uh, reasons for all this weird stuff that's going on, like the lobster teacher and everything else. Uh, so there's there's a bunch of things to uncover, uh, you know, which I don't want to spoil for everybody, but there's there's a bunch of reasons and a bunch of things and a bunch of... Uh, I guess there's, 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 there's going to be fun, some fun stuff, some crazy stuff. Um, it is starting to catch on, kinda. I noticed that I posted the latest Steve comic and like webtoons at first, like I would post a new thing and it would get like 100 views or whatever, but I would also share it on Imgur and, and so uh, PBN recommended Funny Junk. I really don't know my, know my way around Funny Junk, but um, uh, it gets a lot of positive feedback on Imgur. Like the, I'll get like 2,000 views or whatever close to on Imgur. Uh, Funny Junk got like 3,000 views. Um, people asking for the source, you know, they want to keep up with the comic. So, um, that's good. That's refreshing after so many years of being on YouTube and just having, like, no new exposure to anyone. You know, I was starting to get the feeling that, like, maybe I just really couldn't make an entertaining product and no one was really seeing my stuff because I just wasn't really very good. Uh, so it's kind of, it's kind of, like I say, it's a far different feeling to be doing something and then having people wanting to see more and then not only wanting to see more but but as i continue to post starting to see greater quantities of people coming to see the next post um, part of that could be owed to the regularity so i'm going to stick to that as well as i can um but uh but it feels good it hasn't it hasn't it's going to take a little while to build up but ideally if things keep going and if people continue to take interest in it then gradually steve will develop a uh, a readership and that'll be really great so I'm looking forward to that optimistic about that feeling good uh, my art's been improving uh, quite a lot since I started on Steve like you can see a huge improvement just from page one all the way I think we're on page 10 now or that's what I'm working on or uh, what I just finished I think hasn't been posted yet but uh, uh, anyway there's a lot of improvement and I've been sitting down and, and in my off time I've uh, been doing uh, kind of, I guess what you'd call studies, um, I don't know if they're quite studies in the classical sense, but more or less like I'll sit down and I'll pull up like an image specifically, like I'll try to draw a nose really well, like I'll draw a character's face and then try to figure out their nose or something like that. So I've been trying to get it better and better, and then uh, the funny thing about it is that like because it's all the grayscale, I'll, I'll like draw the nose and then like have all the structures and I'll draw out like alright here's where this goes and that's where this and this kind of crests up into the brow and I'm trying to figure out exactly how it all works in a 3D space. And then I just go back and I erase it all except for like the tip of the nose because, uh, you know, that's that's sort of a more elegant look. And uh, and so it's sort of like in the sketches, it's it's more elaborate. And, you know, so the sketches are taking me quite a lot of time. But like I say, uh, Steve started off as drawing practice and continues to be that. Um, I've been drawing, I drew a concept for like some things that are coming up with Linda and uh, then started to color it, which... Uh, you know, it's just a huge waste of time as far as production goes, but, uh, but uh, I don't really get to color a lot of things, so um, this has been a chance for me to kind of experiment with color and uh, applying color like it's a lineless uh, thing, so there's no, no lines to fill out, so I've just been using shading to define where the character is. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's looking okay. It's, it's, not a, it's not phenomenal, but um, you know, everything's a process. So, uh, so yeah, so Steve, Steve's doing okay. I'm glad to see that, that people are kind of tuning into it. It's, it's still weird. I don't know how much like mass appeal it'll have, but I think weirdness is part of the draw. Uh, so there's that. Uh, the other thing that we're working on that I've been writing scripts on is Kit's Fiscally Responsible Orphanage. And I'm really looking forward to Kit because while Steve is kind of out there and weird and, and, uh, uh, just kind of like bizarre and people will tune in to see like what kind of weird thing is coming up or why am I doing this? Uh, cause I do, I promise there's reasons for all of this. Alex. <laughs> you're, you're, you're gonna find out that there's Steve, Steve has a cause. Uh, anyway, Kit, Kit is kind of more of a story based sort of thing. And unlike Steve, which is going to be wrapped up in about 20 some odd pages, uh, Kit looks like it's going to stretch on to, I don't know, 30 or 40 pages before I can really say that a, a book is done. And what I was reading is that in America, the reason why you have uh, the 25 page story or whatever they're about is because in America, if you do prints, a lot of times what they do is uh, the printing companies will charge you per page. So in America, they like to keep the number of pages down so that they get charged less and then they can sell at their at whatever prices and kind of pull in better margins. So they're thinking more about the margins in the American markets. But in Europe, uh, a lot of times you get kind of a longer, more story, story thick uh, comics and they're a little bit, they can be a little bit more artistic, they can go kind of more in depth. Because uh, in Europe, instead of doing a per page sort of thing, what they'll do is uh, you just sell comics until the printing company has made back their costs, you know, and whatever, whatever uh, profits they decided that they wanted from you. And then after that, 
uh, the profits go to the creator. So, so you can kind of make your book as long as you want, and if the printing company thinks they can make a profit on it, then uh, you know they pull all the profits until your book becomes profitable, and then it's just a royalty system. So there's not really an incentive. Uh, like if you make the book too long, then obviously it's hard to make a profit on, but they tend to be more uh, like 30, 40 pages or whatever is what I read. So Kit's going to be more of kind of like a European style uh, story heavy comic. And uh, I'm kind of excited about that. It's like about this little boy. He's an orphan and he gets picked up and taken away to a, uh, a sort of a unusual orphanage run by this, uh, this guy named Kit. And uh, uh, there's a bunch of mystery concepts there too. We've got the characters lined up. Copy's been working on concepts and they're looking really good. Uh, Copy's a good artist, so, um, so I'm confident that uh, when Kit starts to be ready, she's, she's also gonna build up a buffer before we start releasing. But I'm confident that when Kit's ready to go, you guys are gonna really get into Kit. Uh, right on the first page, we have some action, so it'll pick up pretty quick. Uh, I'm kind of proud of uh, this Kit script so far. It's, it's just looking good to me, it feels good. And I think it's going to be a fun, a fun story that you guys are going to really like. Um, and then finally, they're semi-intelligent. Uh, I don't remember if I mentioned this in the previous video, uh, but uh, Pencils is working on semi-intelligent, not currently. Uh, he did get hired by IDW, so he's actually been doing the... Um, the IDW thing, and uh, if you guys are still reading the Pony comics, um, he's telling me that everything. Uh, he's actually sent me a few a few samples of his work. He's not allowed to tell me like what's in the story or anything like that, but he's shown me some of his uh, uh, his his pages, like some of the like one of the thumbnails or whatever. And he's just like, yeah, like he he was talking about layout, and he was just using it as example. So he was showing me like, um, you know, so like, see, they recommend that they do this layout, and he had like these these sun rays, and it was it was really kind of clever actually. It was sort of neat to look at the way that he. He's got the comic laid out and everything like that. So, um, but anyway, though, Pencils has been working on that comic, and he's been getting good feedback from uh, IDW. They really like the expressiveness that he's put into it. Um, uh, Hasbro, too, had a look at it, and apparently he says that Hasbro also really liked the work that he's done um, from the stuff that he's shown me. It's looking really good. So um, you guys can look forward to a really, like, a really good, like, a really well, he's put a lot of passion in it. Um, I think it's going to come out really great, so you guys should definitely check out his, uh, his pony comic when he's done with it. Um, I, it's, it's about Pinky. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what it'll be called. Um, yeah, anyway, though, he can, you can check out his page. I think he's, he's allowed to talk about it. He knows what he's allowed to say and what he's not. But, uh, but anyway, though, so, um, yeah, so he's been posting about it. He can, he'll tell you about it. He'll tell you whatever he can tell you about it. So, um, so yeah, so once he's done with that, though, uh, I'm not sure if they'll set him up with some different projects or what exactly is gonna be the deal going on. But um, he's already got a couple of pages into Semi Intelligence, so uh, presumably, unless he gets swamped with some other stuff, he'll pick that back up and uh, and get to work on it, and, and uh, that'll look really good. Um, uh, his his, his uh, uh, shoot a non pie story will continue as well too once he's done with the IDW stuff. Um, he's steaming along really good. Like pencils is just a is just crazy hard worker, so um, so you know you it's it's pretty shocking the amount of stuff that he can get done in the amount of time that he does work. Um, sometimes I worry about him. He'll, he'll work until he hurts himself sometimes, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's there's dedication, definitely. Uh, but anyway, though, yeah, 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 so look forward. Pencils Comics, just broadly speaking, pencils, lots of pencil stuff coming up. So, um, so yes, those are the, uh, the business things. Um, oh, like I said, somebody also asked, like, about the, uh, Let's Plays and what I plan to do with those. Um, basically on Fridays, once I'm done with the first kit book, uh, once I've got enough for copy to say like, okay, so here's a completed story, which I say I'm about, uh, 20 pages in right now, which is why I say it's looking like it's going to be a 30, 40 page story because I'm, I really feel like I'm only halfway in, um, but I'm about 20 pages right now and I've got a little bit ways to go. But then once I'm done with the kit story, I think that what I'll do is I'll pick up the let's plays again. So this might be, um, I've been able to do about 10 pages a week. Uh, or ten, yeah, 10 pages a week for Kit is what I've been doing uh, because it's been just Fridays that I've been writing Kit and then I've been working on mostly art stuff and, and uh, Steve aside from that. But uh, so I would expect in like maybe one or two more weeks um, I'll probably be good to start up the, the Let's Plays again. And so we'll get back to those. What I think that I'm going to do though is instead of doing the 15 minute Let's Plays with like the cutscenes that are all cut up, we're just going to continue to have like Ray and her friends uh, bouncing stuff off each other and we'll play some games that I really like. Maybe like Shadow Hearts or uh, Armored Core is pretty cool. Like uh, uh, Shadow Hearts is one of my favorite games uh, I, pretty much of all time. I really, really like that game. But Armored Core is also pretty neat, so I might just do that. The only problem is you've got to play these games or I have to play these games on an emulator. I have physical copies of them 
but I don't have like a game capture device, so uh, I would just have to play them on the emulator, and then you guys will just have to accept that there's going to be problems related to the emulator. Um, they they don't emulate well PS2 games. They're they're not really designed for a modern system. It's really weird. Uh, like the amount of the amount of tax that the game will put on a GPU is pretty extraordinary, and uh, I've had to use a couple of different tricks just to get some of these games running without massive slowdown. So, um, so yeah, but those are just games that I love, and, uh, and so, you know, uh, um, one thing that I think that we can look forward to is the fact that I'm kind of stepping away from YouTube, is that I'm going to be a lot less angry about YouTube. Um, I already feel like I'm in kind of more of a creative world. I spent most of this morning uh, pacing in circles, thinking about story ideas and stuff that I want to do, and so I'm kind of in a more... Uh, I'm in a happier state of mind, and so the YouTube Let's Plays will probably be less bitching about YouTube and more just like, um, you know, uh, kind of having fun with it because uh, uh, I gotta say, like we didn't do, I didn't do a personal time last week, and it's really refreshing to just not, to basically, I didn't even really like open up YouTube at all this this past week, and it was, it was really nice. Um, it's been just a frustrating platform i've been very unhappy on it for quite a while uh haven't felt like i was really able to express myself or do anything on it without shooting myself in the foot any kind of project like man that like that last rainbow dash presents we did we put so much work in it we had a huge team it was like well huge by our standards anyway uh you know <laughs> nobody nobody really I, like uh, it was it was just and it didn't it didn't get any promotion at all you know the system is so bad now on this website um yeah so um so anyway though so yeah so things are things are feeling good things are looking up um i'm i'm hopeful that it'll continue to go on we did lose quite a few patrons but uh you know in 24 hours i haven't lost a patron so maybe that's going to slow down a little bit and we're, we're going to see fewer losses i've also had a couple of people come in so it hasn't been just like non-stop bleeding um, there have been people who have quit the Patreon, and then there have been a couple of people who have come in. Overall, it's been a net loss of about like 10 or 12 patrons or something like that last month. But the uh, the fall started to happen back in July, so um, so yeah, uh, it it uh, it's been ongoing. It's it's pretty much just like whenever I'm not doing a My Little Pony parody, um, we're not getting new viewers, and people kind of just gradually fall off because they're you know, not getting the thing that they signed on the Patreon for, and, uh, you know, I don't know, that's why I say this is, this is not really sustainable, there's no way that I can make anything work in this, this whole environment, you know, unless I were to luck out and do, like, a Lucas the Spider kind of thing, but for that to happen, I would have to be producing something that was very, very high-skilled, and also probably short enough to be shared around everywhere, so it's kind of like this weird, um, like, Lucas the Spider isn't big because of YouTube, it's big in spite of YouTube. And pretty much anything that, that gets big on talent these days is, like, big in spite of YouTube and not really big thanks to YouTube. It's kind of like they would succeed no matter where they posted. Um, yeah. So, uh, uh, that's the business. That's the updates. That's, uh, stuff going on in my life. Um, um, good stuff. Uh, the, uh, the mood issues, the depression from the thyroid meds that I've been taking is, uh, is kind of petered out. It's not so bad anymore. Um, I started taking some vitamin C, uh, Pencil said he had a professor who, uh, suffered similar problems and vitamin C helped him out quite a bit. Uh, I don't know if the vitamin C is actually necessarily helping, but I'm not going to quit taking it. It doesn't hurt to take it. And, uh, and I've been feeling better. So, um. Uh, probably also helps to to have relieved uh, myself of some of the YouTube stress and just not really be in their in their clutches as much lately. Um, just feels good. I don't know. Feels feels good. Not not doesn't necessarily like I'm not seeing like a skyrocket up, but like I say, it's a it's a risk, and uh, it'll build slowly. Like I can't just switch from one thing to another and instantly have it be like runaway success. But uh, like I say, I feel like. There's, I feel good about things. Like I have, I have, uh, I have a good feeling, and uh, I, I, you know, it's it's gonna be good. Gonna be good long run. Gonna be good. Gonna be good in the long. Run. Yeah, and uh, and if we get a big enough fandom following any of these comics, then like I say, we can go back and we can actually make animations, and then there will be an audience that will watch them, and we won't have to rely on YouTube to create an audience for us because we'll already have one. So uh, much better, much better than than just trying to get YouTube to promote actual entertainment for once so um yeah yeah 
Oh, uh, speaking of, I guess one final note that I wanted to point out is, is you probably heard about this, but there was that shooting at the YouTube HQ. Um, what was most interesting about it, like that, that uh, from what I can read, that lady was really kind of extreme in the first place, just very out there personality. But uh, one thing that I can note is that it's just been, it's been strange how sympathetic uh, it feels like a lot of people and, and sometimes even the news articles have been towards this person. Um, and it's something like, uh, I, I, uh, YouTube and Google, they've gotten so strangely inhuman that, uh, I mean, like I was reading this article about this guy who had been, uh, there was, there was, uh, he was like an investor or something like that. And he got wrapped up in this deal. There was this con man who came out and he was like, Hey, you know, like invest all this money into my stuff and you'll make lots of money, you know, investing, da da da. And, uh, and then, like, this guy was kind of watching, and there were lots of things that were sort of fishy. Like, he wasn't dropping names or doing any of the things that rich people usually do. Like, a lot of rich people show up, and, you know, they want everyone to know how rich they are. So they're like, oh, yes, I know Will Smith. Uh, and David Bowie, bless, bless his heart. And, uh, uh, you know, like, they like you to know that they know rich other rich people. Uh, they're connected, you see. You see, all the rich people know each other. And this guy wasn't doing that. And then at one point, he was like, oh, my driver's coming to pick me up. And then he went and he got in a cab. And so this guy was like, oh, shoot. So he started to look further into him, and he found out he was a con man. So uh, they got the FBI involved, and they had this guy deported back to Turkey, I think is where he was originally from. And, uh, and so the con man then got frustrated, and while he was in Turkey, he opened up this website where he created a fake story about how this investor had conned him. And so what Google started doing is because this was such a sensational story and a lot of people were uh, looking at it, uh, whenever you searched this investor's name, Google would bring up this guy's con man story as the first result or the second result or something like that. Like it was at the top of the list. So every time this guy tried to do a business deal, he found himself trying to explain this whole con man thing to his potential business partners because suddenly he was like untrustworthy. There was this story about him being a con man. And uh, it was right around when there was a big uh, white collar criminal thing going on, like some major investor had been indicted on, on embezzling or something like that. So there was already a lot of scandal revolving around people uh, uh, committing these kinds of white collar crimes. So he, he uh, tried to, he went to Google and he tried to get them to take the page down in the search rankings because he was like, it's libel, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's it's completely false like none of this is true you can't just put this at the top of the search results whenever my name shows up and google just you know uh brushed him off and they were like it's not a problem buddy you know if you want to do something about it then you got to sue this guy so he sued the guy and uh, it took like a month or something like that for them to establish jurisdiction it was this big expensive court case it cost him a hundred thousand dollars uh just to conclude the entire thing and then, uh, like, it was so bad that at the end of it, like, the judge presiding over the case, like, apologized to the guy. He was like, on behalf of the entire U.S. Uh, uh, legal structure, I apologize to you for the amount of trouble you've gone through over this. And uh, and it was just like, like, because this guy had done everything right. He he really hadn't committed any crimes. He he managed to stop a con man who'd been conning a bunch of different people and then he himself suffered the uh the accusation of being a con man so finally he goes back to google and he's like all right so here's the court case and he gave him all the information and he showed all this stuff to prove that all right it was it was libel and that this was a completely untruthful web page that was being promoted and so it took google uh if i remember the article like three months to remove the search result and then when they did they put up a warning stating that he had asked his search results to be altered and it was like in red text so it looked like he was still doing something fishy and uh and so he was really upset he says it took months before they finally removed that and uh and the conclusion of the article is he was just like google is a completely inhuman company and uh and he he just uh, you know it was it was just one of those things like that whole that there, so many years ago google used to have that mantra of don't be evil and the perspective of that company has really turned around to a lot of people realizing that google uh is completely irresponsible and really just out of control and the stuff that they're doing can can and does destroy lives and they don't really give the impression that they care you know um, everything is kind of just about Google and and the same thing's kind of going on with YouTube where everything's just about YouTube and so this woman it's weird because I feel like a lot of people sort of understand the frustration with Google and YouTube now like a lot of people relate to it 
And uh, this woman, you know, shot some random people at the YouTube headquarters and has weirdly gathered a certain amount of sympathy. And I think that's very odd and, and probably not really too constructive with the dialogue with uh, YouTube. Because the problem is, with these sorts of things, you can't just, like, go to them and then be like, Well, YouTube, you know, like, if you would just learn your lesson, there wouldn't be any more violence. Uh, you know, it's really not in a... Uh, you can't you can't force them to like be afraid of retribution and have that be the entire system um i mean like in a stable government you know maybe we would regulate them but of course we can't do that in the united states uh, we don't regulate businesses anymore it's anti-competitive somehow even though google is kind of running a lot of monopolies um uh, uh so i mean like the only thing you can really do is somehow persuade them that it's in their best interest to not be this completely um you know pants on head retarded company and uh uh you know like this this shooting thing like people are being sympathetic towards it but i don't really foresee it being any kind of change to their system because the way that they have things run right now is they're finding that spam and just volume produces tons of audience retention and uh you know loads of loads of watch time loads of ad revenue and that's the really big thing is they just love they want the ad revenue and um they are promoting really crazy, really narcissistic, really unbalanced people to the top of their, their lists because these are the people who really want to get their message out there and they're posting like every day and because they're really wild and out there, people will kind of watch them. You know, you've never heard such radical opinions before and then these guys kind of get up there and they're just like, let me tell you why, uh, you know, such and so let me tell you, let me tell you why you should never drive a car, you know, and it's like, oh, I should never drive a car. Um, you know, they're just they're just kind of promoting these incredibly radical personalities, these very um, nutty individuals, people who really probably shouldn't be in the spotlight every single day, uh, but yet they are because they just kind of fit in that system. And so I think that Google, like they're starting to realize what they've done, and they're trying to go back and retroactively cramp down, uh, uh, clamp down on some of the more wild personalities, and they just hit this woman. And she was just already like way over the deep end. So it went from like her making a living on YouTube to just suddenly like, you know, nothing. And, uh, you know, like I say, a lot of YouTubers can relate to that because that's just sort of like the way that their system works. You know, you just wake up one day and you're not favored in the algorithm anymore. So your videos don't get any more views. Uh, not only that, but if you had a lot of subscribers, they're not being notified anymore. Um, YouTube would rather notify them of, of the next vlogger or whatever, because the vlogger posts more video than you. Um, you know, it just changes so fast and they're so callous to it. Uh, like I say, everyone kind of relates to that frustration and that anger. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh, world's world's going to hell in a handbasket. I don't know what to, uh, what to take away from things anymore. I don't really have a, a, a moral at the end of this. Just, um, these are my, these are my thoughts as they tumble through my head. I, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know. So anyway, 28 minutes into this, I think it's about time we start talking about Ico. Uh, this is actually okay, because like I say, uh, Ico doesn't really have much of a story, but I do give a, uh, I do recommend that it. it's a fun watch. Um, it is an anime about a synthetic girl. She's made of synthetic parts, and uh, it turns out that the lab that they made her in exploded with synthetic body stuff, and it's gross. It's a horrible flesh wall that devours humans and men alike. And I don't really understand too well uh, how exactly this whole setting is set up because um, what they explain is like there's this research facility where they're making synthetic organs and synthetic arms and limbs and stuff like that, right? And so what they do is they make an entire synthetic girl and then they remove the synthetic girl's brain and put it in a real girl's body and the synthetic body then like explodes and just like grows on infinitely forever. And they do establish that synthetic bodies need to like eat and drink and stuff like that. So right off the bat, you kind of have this sort of like, well, how is it growing so much? Uh, there's no logical way that this would work, but okay. But then they also kind of have this thing where like, yeah, it flew down, it flowed down the river and we built these dams to try to lock it in. And uh, you know, no one knows what's going on past the dams. And I couldn't figure that out because like there was one point where they deployed drones to check the area out but they were like all the like low flying remote control drones that like you have to be within a good Wi-Fi connection. It was like it was like uh, uh, the commercial the the home the home ownership ones like the, the the ones that people fly at the park. Uh, 
or whatever those kinds of drones and they were like oh all the low-flying drones drones were destroyed by the flesh wall it just reached up and it killed it and i was thinking to myself like well the u.s has all these drones that fly like so high up you can barely even see them i don't really see a flesh wall being able to make it forty thousand feet up in the air but okay sure yeah all right uh the little the little like remote controlled helicopter drones couldn't get in so nothing can be sent up there uh, also, I didn't understand why they had to go all the way up the river to get to the research facility at the end of the show. Because, um, I mean, in theory, like, if it started upriver and then it flowed downriver, then theoretically all of Japan must have been covered for them to not be able to get around it. But, like, I, I didn't understand why they didn't just, like, I don't know, get a helicopter and go around behind the flow of the river <laughs> and then, like, approach from the top down. It would be a lot simpler. But then I realized, well, because then there would be no show because they they would just arrive at the end location at the start of the show and they would have like two episodes and that would be it. So um yeah, like I say it's a fun anime. It's not a, it's not especially logical, um but they don't really they don't make a fine point of of explaining how illogical some of it is. So um it's mostly kind of an action sort of thing. Like it's about these people uh, more or less the show is actually really about these people who like run around in these like jetpack things with like skin that got like rollerblades on more or less and they just like rollerblade up and down the flesh wall shooting all the flesh things that are made and the further they go in the more powerful and monstrous all the flesh creatures become so uh, i mean if you could think about it it's almost kind of like a monster of the week kind of a show where they just keep going further and further in it's like questioning power rangers like why didn't rita just send a bunch of different monsters or whatever you know there's logical reasons that uh, yeah, because then there wouldn't be a show so anyway though um um yeah it's pretty cool like they every time they get to a new monster it's like resistant to their old weapons and so they have to like cut off a piece of the monster and then analyze it in a super fast computer and then like instantly they figure out how to you know load new weapons and then shoot it so there's like the tension of, of can we get close enough to it without being killed to steal some of its body and then give it to the guy to analyze da, 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 and they drive around in this tank and they've got like this this crazy wild girl who's like on the front lines all the time and then like her motherly friend her motherly co-worker her partner and then they've got like the big brother little brother duo and the little brother falls in love with Aiko the the fake girl and one of the things that I thought was funny is that they explained to Aiko, like, the whole plot is that uh, Aiko's fake and they need to take her to the research facility so they can switch her brain with the other body. And they're like, and that will save Aiko. And then she's like, oh, okay, all right, that makes sense. Except right at episode one, I was like, wait, hold on. A <laughs> because what they explain is that, like, all right, yeah, so we switched the brains and then one of the bodies blew up into, like, this horrible monster. And so what we need to do is switch the brains back and then uh, uh, there won't be this horrible monster anymore. So I thought to myself, like, so what you're saying is that you, what you're implying is that this Aiko is the real Aiko, this little girl you've got here, she's the real Aiko, and you're taking her to this facility so you can put the real Aiko in the monster body, and then that'll make, that'll save real Aiko? Like, that doesn't sound right at all. It sounds like real Aiko's in the monster body. And because they were kind of like implying or not letting on that real Aiko, that, that this this uh, fake girl was actually a fake girl, you know, it was kind of like, this is the twist at the end, isn't it? Like, I was like, you're going to tell me, you're going to turn around, you're going to be like, Aiko, you were the fake Aiko all along. And uh, sure enough, they get all the way to the research facility, spoilers, by the way. And then, and then like once they're in there, there's another researcher who's like, uh, I don't know exactly what his problem was. It's kind of, it's kind of funny if you think about how stupid his like hang up was, but he has this daughter who's in a coma. And for whatever reason, he thinks that if he could repeat the experiment that caused this giant flesh wall to exist, that he could save his daughter from the coma. But what's actually keeping her in a coma is that her brain is linked up to this network of bodies that were absorbed by the flesh wall. So she's also part of the flesh wall. And, um, it's funny because one of the other, like, the guy who's, like, trying to get Aiko's brain switched is, like, is, like, Dave Researchman, just turn off the system that your daughter's hooked up into. And he's, like, no, they're trying to trick me. And he really doesn't have a good reason for, like, why this is. And it feels like at some point, like, surely when they were transporting her or at any point in the, like, they must have disconnected her from all the flesh bodies at some point because it turns out that what happens is the way they wake her up from the coma is they just turn off the machine that she's plugged into. It's great. Like, this this other guy comes in, one of the other scientists comes in, and he's like, he's like, everyone stop. Like, he finds the people who are looking after her, and they're like, everyone, flip the power switch. <laughs> and they're like, what? 
And they're like, yeah, have you tried just turning off the machine? The one that's got her brain held captive? And they're like, oh gosh, no. And they just turn it off and she wakes up. So uh, so anyway, though, so he wants to like gain control of Aiko, though, this, this evil researcher. He wants to control Aiko. He wants to gather her so he can take her brain out and study it so he can figure out how to make his own his own brain so he can save his daughter from the machine that just needs to be turned off <laughs> and, and anyway so um so yeah there's like a whole battle at the end and then it's like a big reveal and he's like Aiko did they tell you you're the fake Aiko and she's like nah uh because my body has a serial number in it and they're like where's the serial number and she's like in my eyeball and then like everyone goes quiet for a little bit and they're like Aiko your eye is part of your brain. And she's like, what? And they're like, yeah, yeah, you're the fake brain. Uh, apparently we're putting you in the fake body. Fake brain goes in fake body, real brain goes in real body. You've got the real body. And then the girl's like, what? No, but my body is fake. And they're like, oh yeah, about that. So the original girl's body was so badly messed up that at some point during the procedure, we realized we would just have to wholesale rebuild her. So pretty much your entire body is just, you know, synthetic as well so you're just completely synthetic everything about you is synthetic and and then she's just like oh oh gosh and she runs off like she runs off and so there's like a whole episode of her um trying not to be you know put in the monster body which oh you know okay fair enough i can understand her not wanting that but then like the real Aiko contacts her and she's like hey fake Aiko and fake Aiko is like oh gosh real Aiko all right, look, you're probably mad. I understand you don't want to be in the monster body. And she's like, I have been in the monster body for like, I don't know, two or three years, something like that. Um, I've gotten used to it. I've given in. I'm really sad. I'm really miserable. Uh, but, you know, we're psychically linked. So I got to experience some of the fun in your life. And uh, you know what? I relate. I relate. I wouldn't want to go back in the monster body either. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sacrifice myself. And then, uh, and then you just live on as Aiko, because it's the same as far as I'm concerned. And so, uh, real Aiko does that, and then fake Aiko is like, ah, oh, shoot, now I look like a dick. Now I'm the selfish one. So she goes back to the, the researcher main character, and she's like, listen, um, I've been thinking about it, and I actually am up for that sacrifice. Don't let real Aiko kill herself. Real Aiko is being the better person. <laughs> like, I want that to be me. Um, let's, let's go ahead and do the brain swap. So they swap her brain. And then fake Aiko, all of her, with her massive fleshy wall, she just gives birth to herself. So now there's like two identical Aikos. And it's sort of happily ever after. And that's the anime. And I make it sound really stupid and really dumb. But uh, as far as it goes, like the pacing is good. Um, the characters are really likable. It's kind of more of an adventure action kind of thing. And it's not stacked too deeply in, in uh, the action. Like there's a lot of uh, back and forth between the characters. They form emotional bonds and things like that. So the story is really more about the journey. It's not really about the destination or about the plot. Um, it feels very much just kind of like a fun, a fun like journey, journey style story. And uh, the animation is really good. It looks really pretty. Uh, it was a fun watch and I had a good time. Like I say, uh, the first time I did this, I tried to tell the story of Aiko, and then I realized there's not really much of a story. But uh, but but uh, for what it's worth, it's actually pretty great, and uh, and I enjoyed it. So uh, yeah, yeah, that's what's been going on. That's that's Aiko. Uh, those are things. I suppose uh, that'll be it for today. Thanks for joining me, everybody. I'll catch you all next time.